Thank you so much for coming. Very much appreciate it. So thank you for having me here to discuss The Death I Want, A Physician's Journey into Medical Aid and Dying. I'm here as a volunteer from Compassion and Choices, which is the nation's oldest and largest nonprofit committed to improving care and expanding options at the end of life. As Atul Gawande said in Being Mortal, life is meaningful because it is a story, and in stories, endings matter. I'm going to share with you my journey from doctor to patient to advocate for medical aid in dying so that you will better understand the issues involved. However, my journey is still in progress. My mission is to bring about an option for the relief of intolerable suffering during the end of life to adults in Massachusetts and to expand patient autonomy, and I need your help. Who am I? I am a physician who cared for many people during the end of life. I have incurable metastatic stage four prostate cancer. I want to share my story, my thoughts about medical aid in dying, and to talk about 27 years of experience in Oregon and other states, and to talk about the status of this in Massachusetts. So what's my background? I wanted to be a doctor since fifth grade. I found my two loves while I was at Georgetown Medical School. My wife of 45 years and mother of our three children and internal medicine or adult medicine. After graduating from training, I became or I developed an addiction. I became a workaholic. I practiced in the office and the hospital. I worked in Brockton for most of my career, which is an underserved area. It's a majority minority and immigrant city, and it's different times. I did it all. I had primary responsibility for medical care of my patients. I would see them in the office. If they got sick, I would see them in the hospital. And if they got very sick, I was there attending in the coronary care unit, treating their heart attacks and other heart problems, or in the intensive care unit, treating their multi-system failure, managing their ventilator, all those sorts of things. It was a good fit for me, and my training permitted me to do that. Um, I felt like I was needed and could make a difference in Brockton. And I had many experiences with dying people. My practice had many people with chronic illnesses. I was their primary physician. I would direct their care through to the end, taking care of their heart disease, their chronic lung disease, their diabetes, all those things. As I got closer to death, I would continue caring for them. Some had cancer including prostate cancer like me. And I took over once the oncologists were done. So I'd always tell my patient, I'm sending you to the oncologist, but we're not done. You know, I'm here for you. I will be here with you to the end. And I became their hospice physician um, when they went on hospice. I also had the um, opportunity to help some of my patients who had incurable pain with something called palliative sedation. Um, so a handful of my patients had pain that we couldn't get under control anyway. And I would talk with them, I'd talk with the families, and I would put them on a drip of, uh, usually I'd, or always I used morphine to put them to sleep. I would be telling them yeah, we're going to get rid of your pain, but it's going to mean that you're going to go to sleep and you're never going to wake up again. And everyone was fine with that. I worked in a Catholic hospital 
it's fine, and everyone was on board with this. And it was a wonderful thing for people who used it, but it was completely under my control. The one thing that I didn't do is when people asked me for medical aid in dying. Now, they didn't use the term, but they let it know that they were ready to die. And this terrified me. My father always said, don't do anything where you can end up in prison. And I put my fear ahead of my patient's needs. And I'm embarrassed by that standing up in front of you and telling you that now, because it's definitely unethical. But some doctors would have given treatments. I had no role models. No one I knew was doing this. This was all hush-hush medicine. I relieved people's suffering, but I didn't necessarily give them the control to end their life when they would, um, on the terms that they wanted. So I helped to realize, help people to realize that death is inevitable. Everyone knows this, but no one believes that it really applies to them. It's kind of funny that way, as probably the same way. I help people to decide how much care to get. Too much care can be worse than less care, as it can increase suffering. By necessity, I had to do palliative care before there was such a specialty. As I matured as a physician, I tried to discuss the objectives of care. To improve quality of life, to do end-of-life planning, which is all about understanding what is important to us, what are our values, what are the things that we want to have in our life, same as it is during the rest of our life. And I counseled people at the end of life with care goals. And I would really push a little bit on this and tell people, you need to continue to live and help them to decide what they considered appropriate care. How I learned about dying kind of sounds funny coming from a doctor, but end of life was not taught at medical school. Um, when I had my first death as a third year medical student, I remember talking to my resident, the guy who's in front of me, saying, you know, I want to go home. I want to understand what death and dying is about a little bit more. And he literally took me by my shoulders, turned me around, and said, you have other patients to take care of. You can't do that. You need to get back to work. That was my sole teaching, really, about end of life. But I had many other teachers in my life. My dad taught me that there are things worse than death. So I knew what to do when he was brain dead. And as his healthcare proxy, I was able to take him off the ventilator and you know, let him die. I had a patient who was in his um, mid-70s. And we were talking about what we'd want or what he'd want um, as he got you know, older and end of life. And he said, I live my life, just let me go. And I was, you know, I listened to it. I obviously remember it. I know who the patient is. I could give you his name, um, but I didn't understand it. But he just wanted comfort care when he got sick. And I was wet behind the ears, and I didn't get it. But now I get it. I understand what he is saying. And I talked to people deciding that the quality of life with certain treatments was not worth living, or was it? You know, their decision, such as going on dialysis, such as going on a ventilator, and possibly living on a ventilator for the rest of their lives. So we had all those types of discussions. So what's the personal side of death for me? When I turned 40, we had six deaths in my family and my wife's family over a year and a half. I felt like I was going to funerals and churches and whatever for that whole time. My mother was one of the earlier deaths. She had a horrible death from pancreatic cancer. 
Um, my father-in-law, um, John, died of an abdominal sarcoma, which is a soft tissue cancer of the abdomen. And both of those were difficult lingering deaths. And it was at that point in time that I decided I would want the option at my end of life. This is when I first decided that should I ever be, it, that I should be able to end my suffering when it was more than I could handle. And this is the essence of medical aid in dying. And I was young, I was 40, youngish, and I thought about myself. And that was my first impulse, to think about myself, then to think about my family. As I matured more, I started to think about this as a justice issue, that if this was something that I wanted, other people might want this as well, and that if I could get this, other people should be able to get this. So justice is the ability of two people in the same circumstances to have the same outcome. And I consider this an issue of justice. This is available in some places for some people, and it should be available for everyone in the Commonwealth, not just the people who are able to get up and go to other states where they can get this option. It should be available here. What was my transition to patient? In 2002, I turned 50. Like a good little internist, I got a PSA, which is a screening test for prostate cancer. It was elevated. I went to see my friendly urologist. He said, come on down. And he gave me six kicks in the butt, taking a biopsy. And one little corner of one of the biopsies, 5%, which is as small as they do, showed a little bit of cancer. After thinking about what I should do, I had surgery because I felt like I was young. I had you know, children at home, uh, three, and I wanted to be around as long as I could, and I felt like this would give me the best chance of a cure. Postoperatively, I was told my PSA which is the way they measured cancer, was zero, and that I was, quote, cured, unquote. However, I looked at the pathology myself, and it had aggressive features in the cancer, and I knew that this was not a good prognosis. I went back to work in three weeks. However, having cancer is a journey, and you are never the same. Gradually, I started having small elevations of my PSA, and I was told, oh, this is nothing to worry about. Eventually, I went and got a second opinion, and the, you know, the doctor, Dana Farber, said, your cancer is back. I was in radiation. I was receiving something called salvage radiation, which is what it sounds like. They're trying to salvage a cure, and it helps about one in three individuals. While I was getting the radiation, I had a lesson. So radiation, you're in a big room. You come in, you lie down for about five minutes or so of active treatment. You know, a machine goes over you, it delivers a radiation dose. And I looked in the left-hand corner of the room, and there was a ventilator sitting in the corner there every day. And I'd been in hospitals most of my adult life, and some before, and I couldn't figure out why that ventilator was in the room. And I saw it one day, I saw the next. Finally, I had my meeting with my radiation oncologist, which is a once a week thing, and he said, it's for the kids. What do you have to worry about? So this was for children who were like a year or less who couldn't lay still for five minutes to get radiation. They had to be knocked out every day, get an IV started, you know, be put out so that 
and put on a breathing machine so that they could lay perfectly still. And I realized that some of these kids weren't going to survive. I had lived at that point 55 years. I had a great life. You know, I had a roof over my head for my whole life. I had wonderful, wonderful parents. I went to the best schools. I have a great wife. And, you know, I had lived a life. And if I would have died at that time, it's no big deal. But for those kids to die was a real tragedy. And it really helped me to put my life in perspective for me and to help me to accept my death. Now, that's my philosophy, and it helps me get through life. Everyone has their own, but I thought that's worth sharing. It was my gift of cancer. Unfortunately, my salvage radiation didn't work, and I was diagnosed as having stage four. I had my first bony metastasis in 2011. In the past 22 years, I have had eight cancer-related surgeries, six courses of radiation, and six different medical treatments, and I still have cancer to this day. While I'm extremely grateful to be alive, all treatments and medications have exacted a price on me. This includes developing a neuromuscular disease, probably secondary to the immunotherapy I received. In 2022 and 2023, I had four fractures of my vertebra, secondary to my treatment, which was very painful. I've outlived my prognosis. I have something called castrate-resistant prostate cancer, and I should be dead. I've had that for eight years. With excellent medical care and good fortune, I've survived that, survived so far. I needed to stop working due to multiple medical disabilities in January of 2015, so I'm coming up on 10 years. It happened rather suddenly, but one week after I stopped working, I went to a lecture about medical aid and dying, much like this one at something called the Death Cafe in Falmouth. My wife and I decided to become involved with this movement back then. It felt right to me. For my patients who died with more suffering than they would have wanted, for my mother and my father-in-law. I was also motivated by a young woman named Brittany Maynard. Now, if I would have asked you a number of years ago, most of you would know who she was. Today, I'm not so sure. So Brittany was this beautiful 29-year-old media-savvy woman. She had just gotten married, and she started having headaches. Um, long story short, she ended up having a brain tumor, and she started to work for medical aid in dying. She was on the cover of every magazine on radio and television. You've all seen pictures of her. Um, and she died in 2014 after moving from California to Oregon so that she could get medical aid in dying. Um, it was a horrible illness for her. It was a rough death. I've been in touch with her husband, Dan Diaz, who was doing this work as well, trying to get medical aid in dying. And I realized that I could advance the argument for medical aid in dying from my perspective as a doctor who worked with people at their end of life, as a patient with cancer, as a son who witnessed a bad death. But this would require my giving up something that was really, really important to me, which is my privacy. So what is medical aid in dying? It's a practice in which a mentally capable adult with a prognosis of less than six months of life expectancy, same thing that we use for people to go on hospice, ask their physician for a prescription to self-ingest to bring about a peaceful death in their sleep 
if their suffering becomes too severe. There's, there was a bill before the legislature, an act relative to end of life options. The summary of the bill is over there. There's safeguards um, and other information about it. Um, so it was called an act relative to end of life options, H2246 and S1331. It was initially written by um, uh, Lou Kafka and um, his uh, Ted Phillips um, then uh, was actually the one who wrote it in his office. He's now the rep there. And there are many safeguards for the bill. In fact, this is the most restrictive bill in the country. So what are the safeguards in the mass bill? One, people have to be an adult resident. Two, you have to be terminally ill with a less than six month life expectancy. Three, two different doctors have to certify that you're terminally ill, that there's no coercion, and that you're mentally capable to make decisions. Four, you have to be evaluated by a mental health uh, professional to say that there's no impairment in your judgment. Five, it has to be self-request only no coercion, no proxy can ask, and you can't have a guardian. Six, you have to be able to self-ingest it, either through your mouth or through a tube. Um, you cannot have euthanasia, which I'll explain in a bit. Number seven, it's voluntary for everyone involved. Of course, the patient, but also the doctor and the pharmacist. Number eight, you have to have two separate requests um, with the 15-day waiting period. Nine, the first request is orally. The second request is written with two witnesses and at least one disinterested party. Number 10, the death is due to underlying disease to protect life insurance and in conformance with medical standards. 11, you have to be asked if you want to change your mind at least five times during the process. And number 12, all other options have to be explained to you. Other states give exemptions for people who are going to die in less than two weeks. And some say that if you're on hospice already, you don't need a second opinion. And this is allowed for people from out of state in Oregon and Vermont. How have the safeguards worked? Medical aid in dying has been available in Oregon for 26 years and in nine other states in the District of Columbia. There has not been a single case of abuse or coercion, nor any criminal or disciplinary charges filed not one in any jurisdiction. Some members of the disability community have raised concerns for members of this group. I am disabled. When I look into what the disability rights um, uh, organizations have written about it um, in states that have medical aid in dying, um, these are groups that protect the rights of people with disabilities, they're lawyers, and they try and make sure that people with disabilities are not abused. So Disability Rights Oregon, has, which gives legal help to people with mental and physical disabilities, say they've had no complaints of coercion. The only complaints that they have is some people with disabilities may not be able to access, access um, medical aid and dying because of their disabilities. That's the only complaint they get, that the law is too restrictive there. Disability Rights New Mexico said that one of their fundamental rights that we support is the right to make your own decision whenever you're competent to do so. They didn't have problems with the New Mexico bill. There have been many studies that have shown 
no adverse impact on vulnerable, disadvantaged, elderly, people of color, et cetera. Most people with disabilities support having the autonomy to decide for themselves about this issue, with 77% of the people in Massachusetts wanting the option once they understand what the safeguards are, with a similar number favoring this in national polls. Pain, disability, and age alone are not terminal conditions under this law. So medical aid in dying is not euthanasia, and it's not suicide. So why do I say that? So what is euthanasia, and how does this differ from medical aid in dying? So euthanasia is the killing of a person with an incurable and painful disease by someone else. It differs from medical aid in dying, as only the individual can self-ingest voluntarily. It's illegal in all states for people, but it's a standard of care for our pets. What is suicide, and how does this differ from medical aid in dying? So I define suicide as an individual causing their premature death due to psychological despair with impaired judgment. For example, jumping from a building. But how many of you remember what happened on 9-11? Many people chose to jump from the World Trade Center. The medical examiner had to determine a legal cause of their death. And he thought about this and eventually came up with saying that they didn't go to work planning to die, unquote. They made a rational and autonomous decision. The medical examiner decided that they do, died due to terrorism. And this is like medical aid in dying. People with a terminal illness making a rational, autonomous decision to limit their suffering. Their death is inevitable. They don't want to die. Usually, they don't take their medication until their suffering is too severe. And a third of people who get the prescription to take never take it, and they die without having ever used this. Suicide is, always secret, is almost always secretive. Medical aid in dying is always collaborative. Usually, people discuss this first with their family for months ahead of time. They discuss it with two doctors, and in Massachusetts, they need to have a mental health evaluation. The American College of Legal Medicine state law differentiate medical aid in dying from suicide. Um, suicide and medical aid in dying are conceptually medically and illegally different phenomena. Opponents falsely claim that medical aid in dying is suicide, and then claim it has attributes and treatments available to suicidal people. This is absolutely not true. Most people don't take the medications right away, but they will not respond to antidepressants and change their mind about whatever and feel good about their death. They're still suffering. They are making a rational and autonomous and collaborative decision on how to deal with their suffering and their end of life. So how have 10 states and District of Columbia gotten there? So 1994, um, after AIDS ravaged a large number of predominantly young men, they were dying, there was no treatment, and they had horrendous deaths. This movement started. Um, there was an initiative in Oregon, and this was initially before there were any treatments, and it passed by a little bit. This being America, it was stopped in court. The legislature then came in, thinking that it would never pass again, had a second initiative, and it passed by a larger uh, vote, 
and it became law in 1997. In 2008, Washington State also had an initiative, and they passed it. 2009, there was a lawsuit in Montana, Baxter versus Montana. Baxter found out on the day of his death, or maybe he didn't find out, um, that medical aid in dying was legal in Montana in the lower court, and subsequently went to their Supreme Court and passed. It's ironic, but his grandson um, died of pancreatic cancer, had a miserable death, but was able to use this to limit his suffering. In 2013, our neighbors in Vermont became the first legislature to pass this. 2015, um, the California legislature passed this, and Brittany Maynard's wish came true. In 2016, there's an initiative in Colorado, and by a two to one vote, this passed. The same year, the District of Columbia Council um, passed this. Legislatures then passed this in 2018 in Hawaii, 2019 in New Jersey and Maine, and 2021 in New Mexico. Currently, 22%, almost a quarter of the country, is able to avail themselves of medical aid in dying. So why do people need medical aid in dying? Or what is end of life like? This is not an easy discussion, and I'm sorry if any of you are squeamish, but this is kind of a sanitized version. So medical aid in dying is an option for people to end their intolerable suffering. Many of you have firsthand experience where people die by inches, gradually losing the things that make their life enjoyable. Cancer is the most common reason. As cancer progresses, it saps the energy out of the person. As tumors grow, they cause pain and other symptoms. Treatments may cause nausea, vomiting, constipation, and fatigue, as may the cancer. Quality of life gradually and continually diminishes. In addition, for these people, today is the best day of the rest of their life, and they know that. 60 to 90% of people with cancer have something called breakthrough pain, which is severe pain that comes on over the narcotics that they're taking for their usual pain. Hospice and palliative care are great. Hospice extends life expectancy four to five weeks longer over uh, usual medical care. Many people die suffering. 25% of people die with uncontrollable pain. 21% die with uncontrolled shortness of breath. I'm sorry, that was uncontrolled shortness of uh, pain. Might you want an alternative when you die? Studies show that medical aid in dying improves care for everyone, not just the people who use it. Doctors have to learn how to talk to people at the end of life and better direct care. They also have to have better use of pain medicines. Doctors are like most other people in the society. They don't like to talk about death and dying, and they try and avoid it, unfortunately. It increases the use of hospice care Hospice care doubled in Oregon, um, and it was more appropriate. The right people were on it for the right length of time. It increased the number of people dying at home to over 50%, first and I believe only state where that has happened, and that's where people want to die. It virtually ends end-of-life suicide because people know that they have an option to control their suffering. 
and doctors assisting people to get medical aid in dying through the wink, wink, nod, nod school of medicine. There's a recent article that just came out that shows that about a person a day, 360 per year, end up committing suicide with a cancer diagnosis. And I've asked them to look at how that is in medical aid in dying states, and I'll bet you it's just about zero. So who uses medical aid in dying nationwide? 72% of the people have cancer. 11% have neurologic in illnesses such as ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, a progressive neurologic disease where you're not able to move, eventually not able to breathe, to eat, talk, and Parkinson's disease are the two ones that um, people use this for most often. 80% are over the age of 65. 86% of the people are on hospice, and usually for a longer period of time. So what is the process that leads to medical aid in dying? This is somewhat old data, but I haven't seen anything newer, and it just gives you an idea of what happens. So 17% of terminally ill people discuss this with family, usually months ahead of time. Two to 10% discuss it with do their doctor. 0.6% get a prescription, and that number has recently gone up because of some uh, ways that it's been made easier in some states. Less than 1% of the people who die, die with medical aid and dying. A third of people don't use it, but it helps to relieve their anxiety around having uncontrollable suffering. 96% of the people who use this are dead within six months. The total number of people dead using medical aid and dying across the country is about 6,000 people as of, I believe, 2020 or 2021. How do people use this? People pre-medicate first, <coughs> excuse me, um, to help the, um, the stomach, the GI tract, to work better and prevent nausea and vomiting, which are common issues at the end of life. They have to quickly drink a large number of dissolved medications. It's in about three to four ounces of fluid so it's not very difficult, but it may be bitter. People then will fall asleep, the mean in five minutes, and people will die a median in 51 minutes, so less than an hour. That's not everyone, but that's the mean. 99.5% are successful. Um, usually it's nausea and vomiting or lack of absorption that causes people not to have this succeed, and it hasn't caused harm. So what's the history of medical aid in dying in Massachusetts? Legislation dates back to 2008-2009 legislative session. This past session, we had 68 House co-sponsors out of 140, and we had 19 Senate co-sponsors out of 40. And we had, large, we had a majority of people who you know, may not have co-sponsored, but had committed to um, voting for the bill if it came to the floor. 100% of the CAPE delegation were permitted to vote for the current bill, with the exception of David Vieira, who I believe is your representative. Um, Kathy Alphonse, or Fox Alfano, is running against him, and she has expressed her support for the legislation. And David said, if you don't like the way I feel about it, vote me out. So I'm just quoting him. Um, Dylan Fernandez is in support. I'm not sure who he is running against. They're currently having a recount. Uh, between Mira Torrey, um, who I know is a supporter, and McRae, and I don't know where she stands. 
This bill went further than before. It passed the Joint Committee on Public Health this year. It passed the Joint Committee on Health Care Finance. And it was referred to the Senate Ways and Means Committee, where it sat for eight weeks and now is dead for this session. There was an initiative in 2012. I don't know how many of you remember it. Um, but it lost by 51 to 49 percent. Previously, it had polled over 60 percent, but the Catholic Church spent five million dollars on disinformation at that time um, on ads, and they were great ads. They weren't accurate, but they were great ads. They said they'd throw a hundred pills across a countertop and say, "You have to take these within five minutes, or it doesn't work." But, you know, obviously they get dissolved. Or you could come home and your grandmother could be dead and you don't know about it. Well, you can have obligated uh, notification. People have a right not to share their uh, information with anyone, including family. Um, Dr. Alan Steinbach and I sued the Commonwealth to see if this was a constitutional right like what happened in Montana, we were told it's not a constitutional right. Supreme Court Justice Sergey George asked the question, which I think is the crux of the issue. What interest does a government have in telling Dr. Kligler, we're not going to let you end your life on your own terms. We want you to end it on ours. That's a direct question that he asked. Recently, Compassion and Choices has sponsored suits to permit people from out of state to receive medical aid in dying. Currently, Vermont and Oregon permit this. And I was just talking to someone, and someone from not too far from here uh, went up to Vermont and was able to get medical aid in dying. I don't know much about it, and I don't even know 100% of the accuracy, but there are a number of people who have done that. Um, there's currently a suit in New Jersey um, to get the same right for the people there. So what you'd need to do if you wanted to go to Vermont to use this, or if you know of someone who does, you'd have to find a doctor in Vermont or Oregon and transfer care. There's something called Patient Choices Vermont which is helpful, and if um, anyone needs me, I'd be happy to talk with them and help them uh, you know, navigate this. You have to go through the process and be in Vermont or Oregon to be protected by the law there. If you bring the medication back here, you are not protected. You don't have the same legal rights here. So what is the support for medical aid in dying? here in Massachusetts. In 2023, we did a survey and found that only 16% of people knew that there was a bill out there. And that's part of the reason that I'm lecturing, just so that people know about this. So please, whether you like it or not, let people know so that they can weigh in. 73% of people supported this including 68% of people with disabilities, like me. After being told of the safeguards, 79% of the population supported this, as well as 78% of people with disabilities. Opposition was 15%. All demographics support this by absolute majorities. An absolute majority is over 50%, and almost always it was over 60%. So large absolute majorities, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, Catholics, 76%, Protestant, nuns, people of color, older, younger, everyone was in support of this except for the vote that really counts, and that's in the legislature where we didn't have one. Mass Medical Society, which I'm a member of, it's an organization of doctors, no longer opposes medical aid in dying. 
They are neutral on the subject. They reaffirmed their neutrality last session by an 80% uh, vote. Um, we did a survey of the doctors in Mass Medical, and by a two to one vote, they wanted this legislation as well. The AMA, the American Medical Association, which is nationwide doctors, recognizes that doctors can provide medical aid in dying without violating their professional obligation. Primary opposition is the Catholic hierarchy and a vocal minority in the disability community. So thank you for coming to learn about medical aid in dying. If you, like, if you, like me, believe that we should pass legislation in Massachusetts to give mentally capable adults with a terminal illness and less than six months of life expectancy the option to receive a prescription from their doctor to die peacefully in their sleep. What can you do? I think that I believe, or I know I believe, that you should let your legislators know, whether you agree with me or disagree, you should let your legislators know that this is important to you, whether you agree or disagree, and give them the feedback to that. They're asking for your votes now, and this is the best time to be heard on what you believe. Either way, we're trying to get a buzz in the State House. We've been working on that, and we achieved some of that last session, and we need to get a buzz. So the more you tell your legislator, even if they're in complete agreement with you, they need to hear about this. They need to know that this is an important issue to you. You can um, get or go on the Compassion and Choices website, and there's some literature with their web address there, or the End of Life Options Coalition. Again, they both have a lot of information. And if you want to work on the campaign, there is um, a sign-up sheet, and you can sign up to join Compassion and Choices. And if you want to work on it, you can check, check a box there. So, Thank you very much for your time, and I'll be happy to take questions. What's the actual medication that they give, and does it stop your heart or stop your breathing, or what comes first? <laughs> there is no medication. It's up to the physician to decide, so it varies. They're currently, mostly they're using a combination of medications. The initial drug um, was a sleeping pill, and it would just put people into, you know, deep sleeps like Marilyn Monroe type, type of death where people would die. But that company was bought by a, someone who raised the price of it from a few dollars to hundreds of dollars, and so people have moved away from it. But some will stop your heart. Some will stop your breathing. The first thing is putting people to sleep so that they don't have to suffer with it, but it's a combination of drugs. Hospice nurses prescribe uh, morphine or Dilaudin. Is it as simple as just taking more than they prescribe? And Sometimes that'll work. Sometimes it won't work. Um, sometimes you're so used to narcotics that the overdose you take with this just won't work. And families have been prosecuted for giving their parents um, narcotics. There is a nurse in um, Pennsylvania who was prosecuted for that. Um, she handed the um, a uh, morphine bottle to her father, he drank it, and they um, went, after her. went after her. So, I mean, that's why we need to do it. The other big argument for this is you say, oh, you can do palliative sedation, is that medical aid in dying is about patient autonomy. It's the patient being in charge of their life and their end of life and making the decision for themselves. So they bring it up to the doctor. They talk about it. Most people who bring this up 
get something else to help them. It's like, you know, maybe one in seven or so end up with a prescription so that it's really up to the patient as to what their need is when they want it and if they want it. What about Alzheimer's patients? Because to me, that's one of the worst ways to go. Alzheimer's patients are not men mentally capable, so they are not able to get this. Compassion and choices, remember I said that they work with end-of-life options and to try and help people with end of life. They do a lot more than medical aid in dying. I'm singularly focused on that. But if you go on their website, they have a whole, um, uh, they have a large amount of information on Alzheimer's disease and how to help people with this and how to make decisions around that. So, um, you know. So it's not gonna be part of this for now. It, I don't know that it will ever be part of it. That would have to, that would be its own separate legislation. This helps to deal with one small aspect of end of life issues. There are many other end of life issues out there, but this is just helping part of it. It's not everything. It doesn't, it's not, you know, a panacea. Excuse me, if you could qualify to get this, this drug. You can, you can tuck it away and take it whenever you want. Like, you can put it, you don't have to take it in any particular certain time. So, to me, I'm thinking if you, if you have the drug and you got to a point where you couldn't administer it yourself, you could have your family, a family member do it, right? Or is it, you have to? Have you have to <laughs> self-administer it. So if, first so of all, have you have to be terminally ill. Right in order to get it, and you have to be able to take it by yourself. Otherwise, you're outside the law, and if you're outside the law, you, know, you can, can be and very well may be prosecuted um, for... Uh, yeah. There isn't it true that you can have assistance, so somebody can hold a glass, if you can swallow from yeah. the straw, if you've lost the ability to hold the glass, but somebody can hold it for you. Correct. Yeah, so people will mix up the medication for you in a glass, will give you a straw, but you have to, you know, to um, drink it. People are asked again, you know, do you want to um, take this? They have to be the ones that initiate it, but they have to do an active, an act demonstrating that they are taking it themselves so that it's not euthanasia, uh, not euthanasia which is criminal. What about ALS, though? You can get to the point, like my brother, where you can't swallow and you can't hold anything. ALS is very difficult, and I um, work with Compassionate Choices ALS. We're trying to make the legislation as friendly um, to people with ALS um, and to try and help that. I, it's a huge issue um, in my mind. People with ALS should be able to get this. Um, I'm not sure if we have the complete answer, but we're working on it and, you know, the way the legislation is, I think that people with ALS might be better able to use this. You have the prescription, you give it to a pharmacist, and, you know, uh, prescriptions don't last forever, and, you know, you're probably going to pick it up. It's not usually having much in the way of anything that people are going to abuse outside of what's normally there for hospice. Um, so people generally get it, and they just... Um, stick it away somewhere safe, you know, trying to keep it, you know, like any other medications in a safe area. But you want to do that because, um, you know, you really don't want to delay on this. People who wait too long um, end up not being able to go through the process. So about a third of people who wait till the end end up dying before they go through the process. It's a really, it's a tough process and you can't do it in, you know, 15 days plus a two days wait. 
it takes a lot longer than that. It takes weeks to months, so you need to start ahead of time. And I know you said it before, but what was the percent of people who get the prescription who don't end up taking it? One out of three. Okay. So. Roughly, yeah. 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 And again, having, um, helping people who are dying not to have fear, I think is really worthwhile. You know, if that's all that it did, you know, I think that's uh, that's wonderful, and what I, you know, I'd be okay with that for those people. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. I appreciate you coming out on such a beautiful summer evening. We're not going to have many of these left, and I hope that I was able to help you to make up your mind about this. Thank you.